Welcome everybody to today's 1 million by 1 million strategy roundtable for entrepreneurs. As you know, the 1 million by 1 million initiative aims to help a million entrepreneurs reach a million dollars in annual revenue and beyond, build a trillion dollars in global GDP and 10 million jobs. It's an audacious, ambitious agenda. And the only way we're going to succeed is if you succeed in becoming successful entrepreneurs, because the whole purpose of our existence, the whole justification of our existence is because of you. Um, so we are looking for serious entrepreneurs who have the metal to do what it takes to be a successful entrepreneur and we will put all our resources behind you to make you successful. Um, we will start um, with Mikaline, who is going to be present, our first presenter from New Hampshire. By the way, folks, if you're tweeting, live tweeting the show, many, many of uh, our entrepreneurs do, please feel free to use the hashtag 1M1M. That way you will connect with the other people who are tweeting and get some retweets on your tweets. Mikaelin, if you could unmute the line and come and tell us uh, more about what you're doing and uh, ask your questions. Excellent. Thank you for the introduction. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, you're fine. Excellent. So the name of our, my company is uh, MMIS, and we are a company of uh, very aggressive entrepreneurs. There's 10 of us, uh, and we create business collaboration and compliance software for the life science industry. And what that means, uh, the life science industry, which we're going to talk about in the next slide, are composed of pharmaceutical, biopharmaceutical, and medical device companies. And in the United States, there are approximately 3,000 of these companies, as you can see here in this segmentation. Our products target that sweet spot that you see there. So some large companies, um, it's quite interesting. We did not target some of the large top pharma, but they are coming to us. So we actually are uh, in agreements with Abbott right now and some of the large medical device companies. Uh, one, which is one of the largest in the world, is Care Fusion, and we're closing an agreement with them. Now we're in contract discussions. So we've scaled pretty quickly, but um, to stick to the slides here, this is our customer segmentation. The next slide talks about what the problem is. So in the United States, federal and state law requires that all life science companies, so pharmaceutical and medical device companies, must aggregate and track all payments and transfers of value to physicians beginning January 1, 2012 and every year thereafter. And this is due to the requirements of the government to increase transparency between the physicians that prescribe drugs that pharmaceutical companies and medical device manufacturers make and the public. In order to do that, we developed through our technology solutions the first end-to-end -end compliance solution. It's, soft, it's a SaaS-based solution that networks and links the federal government, physicians, and life science companies. There is a market that is currently uh, what we call the compliance market where we sell our products and it's roughly a $602 million market per year. We are not the first entrance. We entered our product uh, in January. Uh, we developed the product. It took us about uh, roughly uh, 12 to 14 months to develop it. But what we're doing is we decided that we wanted to develop a SaaS solution to provide more features at a lower cost to more people. And we're basically what you call market disruptors. So we've taken our product. There are three in the family. It's a service for the low-end clients, a notification center for all clients, which I'll talk about in a minute. And we have been competing technically on a technical basis with the large pharmaceutical, the large manufacturers. So there are four major competitors in this market and we are now beating those major competitors and winning contracts as you see here. So the next slide, that's fine, you can go to the next slide. So we've proven the concept. Um, Shramana, I think you could say that we've actually proven the concept and we're now seeding the market. Uh, and every time I review these slides, which is really makes me smile, as you can see, you can't see me smiling, but I'm smiling. Uh, we're closing orders every week. 
So we've started to build business uh, in January. We started demoing. Uh, and these are the people, these are the clients that we have, Biotronic and Contact, very small pharmaceutical company. Elon, I would say, is a, a mid to large size company. They're under a corporate integrity agreement. So we've got, and you can see here, we've closed deals that are multi-year contracts. The medical device company uh, that has a pending signature, the order size is actually larger than that. It's about 600000 And that is a multi-year, a three-year multi-year agreement. Uh, so, uh, and then we... Mikhailin, just a quick, quick question here. These two-year, two three-year contracts, these are the, the deal size, is the total deal size across two years, or it's two, uh, like 220840 per year of the two years? Total deal. Total deal. Total. Okay. Great. So Arbor and and Contact they're very small companies. They have to re they have to report just like the large companies, but they don't have as many spend instances because they don't have as many sales reps. They might have one product where, for instance, Biotronic has uh, 2,200 products. So, so these are you, um, have, um, you have at least 710,000 in bookings. You potentially have a couple of million in bookings. We yes as a as a I, these slides were updated as of the 12th, um, and we, as I said, we're going to be over a million in, in backlog. So this is customer booking signed agreements. Yeah. We will not recognize this revenue. We recognize this revenue on a quarterly basis because it's a subscription revenue. Right. So we, do, we recognize the, it on a quarterly basis. What is the revenue uh, forecast for this year, recognized revenue forecast? Uh, can you go to the next slide? This year was it's like 1.2 million. The next year it's That's 7 great. million. Okay. So, so yeah, you know it's the uh, we're losing. You know we're we're we we're losing money now. We're making money, so it's you know it's good. And this is what we're projecting. You know our situation right now is that uh, there is a very drastic need for this product. We have an exceptional product. It's at a great price point. So my questions um, for Sramana today are really, what do we do the next step? I mean, we're at the point right now where we're competing. We've got a great product. We introduced it in less than four weeks. We're hitting the market. But the question for us now is scale. We want to go out and, and really scale because we're a small company. Sejid and Dendrite, they're a publicly traded company. All these other companies, they're small, but they're much larger than us. Like, we're 10 people. If you look at the entire group of people that I work with. I've got developers in uh, India and in Pakistan, and I have developers here, and I've got a, a partners. So if you look at all of the people that work for us, if you will, there's, you know, probably 150 people. But our group is driving this technology. So the brains of the organization and where we're headed with the product development all comes from these 10 people. So can you go back to the, the last slide? Our goal, what we want to do, is we want to become the clearinghouse for federal transparency and disclosure reporting in life sciences. Mm -hmm. We want to find a partner, a larger partner who we can work with in a synergistic manner to scale our business. Mm -hmm. And we need to recruit, we're at the point where we need to recruit some experienced senior management, marketing, and development professionals. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have you know, a couple of thoughts. Of course, you can raise money. You can raise venture money. This is, as I, I think I told you in our previous uh, private roundtable, that um, you are past the angel stage. Your valuation is going to be, you know, if you can defend the kind of backlog we, you're talking about, which presumably you can, your valuation is going to be a north of $10 million, which is not really uh, angel territory. So you are going to need to raise money from venture capitalists and the most logical place for you to raise money is going to be in the Boston venture capital community. And uh, if, you, if you choose to go that route, I'll help you uh, go into the Boston venture capital world and, and you know, do the, the fundraising process there. There are a couple of other options I'm thinking about actually. Uh, we can also explore some channel partnerships for you working with a larger company who would potentially put their channel behind you. Um, this is worth exploring, I think. Um, we work with the, we have put a couple of uh, one million by one million companies into, the, into a channel partnership that is working rather well, actually. Um, and these guys have 30 to 50 major account sales people all over the United States. And we could 
at least talk to them and see if they want to take this on and, and sell your product, in which case you would have immediately, it would be a revenue sharing deal and you would immediately plug into a, a large channel, large national channel. So those are your two options, basically. Or you can continue. What are your thoughts? Yeah, you know, I don't, I, I think that this, we're at an opportunity where we need to scale quickly because the product is there, it's a SaaS solution, it's proven its concept. We need to be, what you said, we need a channel. We need distribution. But what are your thoughts also about uh, a private equity? Because these, for some private equity firms are looking for companies like ours to bolt on to, you know, some of their other businesses that are in our space. What, um, what is your feeling there? That would be an acquisition. You're too small for private equity, except if it's an acquisition. Private equity companies that are grafting together a bunch of companies to bring certain expertise within one uh, umbrella portfolio, that would be an acquisition. That, would, that means you have to be ready to sell the company. And if, you know, if that were the case, would we want to wait until our revenues are scaled a little bit more? over the Absolutely. next few years, why I think would we you want have to do a lot deal now? Potential. You have a lot of potential here. You can build a much larger company and sell later and you will make a lot more money off this company. That depends. If you want okay, to so cash out now and, and uh, you know, if you want to, if you want to sell now and, and cash out, that's an option. Or you can keep building and, and sell at a later date, in which case you will make a lot more money. You have a very, well, very interesting bring, opportunity here. I want to bring some jobs to New Hampshire because I think that, you know, I think the money is great and that's terrific, but, you know, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I want to see this baby grow, not that I have to be the one leading the helm. I mean, I know what I'm good at. I'm great at business development. I'm great at the technology side, but, you know, I don't want to run a company of 100 people. So I'd like to keep the entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial attitude of this group of people because there's a huge market here. So I'd yeah, really love to explore the uh, channel partnership because if I can scale revenues by getting an instant sales force, yeah. that is something that will that be is my amazing. Instinct. That is my instinct also. So why don't we do this? I, I, I would like to open discussions with the channel partner for you. Okay. Perfect. And start negotiating that. Let's do it. Okay. Let's do it. Yeah. Cool. Thank we'll, you. We'll do that. We'll be in touch by email after the show. Okay. Thank you good. so much. Good progress, McLean. Very good progress. Excellent job. Well, I have a good teacher. I have a good teacher. No, no. You're doing it entirely on your own. <laughs> we are just providing with some tools and some guidance, but really, you are the, you are, you guys, entrepreneurs are the ones who are, we don't take any credit away from entrepreneurs. It's your achievement. We are just helping you a little bit behind the scenes. And, you know, I know you're busy and I'm not, this is not a plug. Uh, it's, it's unsolicited. Let's put it this way. Every time I have a question, if I email you or Maureen, I get an answer. It's not an answer two hours later, three hours later, whatever. You are answering my questions. And for entrepreneurs, we need that. So thank you very, very much. I appreciate it. You're most welcome. All right, Richard, uh, if you could unmute your line and uh, tell us about my stream. Yes, yeah, sure. Okay, I'm here. Well, um, you know, what we really thought we've created is kind of the next revolution in music experience and exposure. So, you know, uh, essentially it started with something that I wanted to use. I was traveling with my friends and, you know, I wanted to to hear the music that my friend was playing. And if we were able to get a shared car on the train, that'd be great because we would play it out of portable speakers uh, and we'd all get to listen to it. But as soon as we couldn't find uh, a car on our train, you know, we'd all be back to our own uh, iPod limited so selection. And that was uh, before the iPhone. Um, but I just started to think if wireless headphones exist, if splitters exist, if portable speakers exist, why can't I hear what my friend is playing while I'm with him while he's playing it? It, it, it makes sense to me. 
Uh, and then I thought, hey, if you add a buy now button to the listeners, then you're not only are you increasing exposure to new music, but you're increasing the likelihood of someone purchasing that music. Uh, so, you know, I kind of just kept thinking about it. And then finally the iPhone came out and it seemed like it was actually uh, an opportunity. Uh, so about a year and a half ago, I found Joe Cerisi, who, uh, you know, has been a CTO for 20 years now. And he really just kind of got excited about the idea and uh, was fully behind it. And so essentially I kind of inherited his uh, a team of developers that I've been working on this with since June of 2010. Um, and now we've got a live functioning app that, oh, well, you can go back for a second, actually. Uh, we, we have a live functioning app, but um, I guess on this slide you can see, you know, we've also built out all of our marketing materials. So, you know, no matter where you come across us, whether it's, you know, through our landing page uh, or Facebook or YouTube or Twitter, you know, you'll realize that there's a lot behind what looks like a, a simple product. So, uh, Richard, we need to true. understand what the mm -hmm. product does. I don't think anybody understands what you do. Okay, so I guess essentially at its most basic form, it's a multi-directional wireless headphone splitter. So I could play a song that I have on, I could play any song, uh, um, podcast, unprotected audiobook that I have on my device, on my iPhone, iPod Touch, iPad. And as long as you are within Bluetooth range of me or on the same Wi-Fi network as me, mm -hmm. I will show up to you with what I'm playing. You can click on me, connect to me, and hear what I'm playing as I play it. Uh, and you have a buy now button to be able to purchase what I'm playing if you like it. Uh, and since it's, you can use Bluetooth. So what are the it. expectations in terms of uh, who has what uh, in a, in, so let's look at a use case. Uh, you and I are traveling on the train and, and you are playing something on your iPhone and you have a, a Bluetooth uh, ear, a headphone that you're listening to the music with and I have a Bluetooth um, your phone, I guess, and uh, but I don't. I, I need to also have an iPhone. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, you don't need to have Bluetooth headphones. The Bluetooth is what connects the two devices. So you just have your regular. Everyone has the regular headphones plugged into their own device, and Bluetooth connects the two phones, and it actually works on more than a one-to-one -one basis. It works on a one-to-group basis. So I could be with four of my friends and I could play something and, and four friends could connect wirelessly uh, to hear what I'm playing as I play it. And everyone hears it in their own, okay. you know, regular plugged in headphones. Um, uh, so, you Got know, it. essentially so our slogan is share your music, not your headphones. The use case, anytime you see someone on the train with one earbud in their ear and one earbud in their friend's ear, you know, now you can play it on your own device. They can hear it at the same time as you on their own device and now you don't have to share headphones. Um, what kind of customer validation have you got? Right now we have over 30,000 users in over 90 countries uh, with essentially no marketing thus far. Uh, it's really just been based off of people wanting to write about us. Just last week I mean, sorry, just in August, we were called uh, an awesome app by Rolling Stone. Uh, just last month, we were in Details Magazine as one of three music apps to download now. And what about uh, uh, Spotify. What business model? So, uh, so by the way, this is, not a, this is not really a PR exposure kind of opportunity. Mm -hmm, this mm -hmm. is, as you can see, this, right, is, right, right. this is a different forum. Uh, it's a forum for business strategy discussion. So... Uh, if you could keep the discussion on your business strategy, what is the business model of the of your company? So right now we've left it as, as so we get a commission off of song purchases through it. Uh, we have an ad banner within the app, uh, but we also intend eventually to charge for it. Uh, so right now, since it's free, uh, we're really pre-revenue. Um, but once we, uh, you know, essentially add the download fee, I really even see 
it being, you know, music being the driving factor. Everyone likes to share music, and a lot of the time, you can only really force someone to listen to what you want them to listen to when you're with them. And right now, there's no other solution that can do uh, what we do. So what is the validation on the business model? Is Have you have you been able to charge the 5% commission on songs purchased? Hello? The phone call got dropped. Give me one second. I'm just gonna... Welcome to your conference, powered by Ring 2. One moment, please. He should be back. Hello. Uh, Hi. Can you hear me now? Yes. I was asking, um, have you been able to validate this assumption that this 5% commission on all songs purchased? Yes. The, the, song, the song commission is already there. Uh, the, I, the revenue from advertising is already there because uh, we use uh, an Apple iAd drop-in, um, which eventually we can replace by serving our own ads and getting 100% of the ad revenue. Um, and, you know, numerous reviews have said it's worth money, but no, we've never actually, we've, we've kept it free from the beginning just to try to grow our user base uh, okay. as opposed to try to extract the fee from that at the beginning. Okay. All right. Keep going. Okay. So our potential customers are really uh, anyone that enjoys listening to music uh, or podcasts or audiobooks or stand-up comedy and sharing that audio with the friends that they're with. Um, Right now, there exist uh, multi-directional headphone splitters where you could plug in to a device and connect four headphones to that one, you know, uh, wire, uh, and those cost $20. Uh, MyStream does the same thing, except it's wireless. wouldn't take up any room in your pocket, so you always have it. All listeners have a buy now button, and it can support more users. And lastly, it'll cost one tenth the price. So for a dollar ninety nine instead of twenty dollars, you can get even more uh, functionality. You know, although we see so the target demographic, although we see it, you know, useful for you know two thirty five year olds going for a run or a husband and wife by the pool with an audio book, uh, the kids, the people that are most sharing music and will we think will be the fastest adopters to this technology are 13 to 25, uh, high school through college. Uh, and some of the immediate uses we see are, you know, kind of on the bus ride to or from school sharing your favorite band, you know, in the library, at a college quad, going for a run, any type of traveling, uh, hanging out at the beach or pool where, you, you know, you don't really have uh, access to speakers. Okay. Uh, and so the market analysis, you know, to date there have been over 200 million uh, compatible iOS uh, devices sold, um, which is obviously, you know, growing every day. And there have actually been over 130 million Android devices. Uh, over the next six months, we plan to expand to the Android, um, you know, thus doubling our uh, potential user base. Um, yeah, and uh, we also work even better over Wi-Fi, which is why we like to point out the statistics in increasing Wi-Fi traffic, because right now using uh, MyStream, one person could put on a playlist and 20 people could connect to that person and hear what they're playing at the same time. So I don't know if you've ever heard of these uh, silent discos that kids have where everyone dances around hearing music in their own headphones. Well, now, using only iPhones, iPod Touches, iPads, a Wi-Fi network, and one person's playlist, anyone can have that uh, anywhere. Okay. What do you think is the total available market from a bottom-up market analysis point of view? Um, I mean, you know... Right now, Shazam has over 150 million downloads. I think it were a little bit similar to Shazam in that it's really kind of only useful mobily because you're not, it's not really something you're going to want to use at your desktop. It's not something that you're going to want to use every day, um, but it does have its kind of unique music applications. Uh, so, I mean, really the high end, obviously, would be, you know, this is what everyone uses essentially as a headphone splitter 
and you know you get to kind of just say I'm level at hundred. But how big is the headphone but, splitter market? Um, as far as a, a solid, as far as actual device, I mean it's probably. Well, I'm asking about. Do you know how to do bottom-up market sizing analysis? I mean, I do understand what you're what you're saying. I'm not sure the year annual sales of uh, headphone splitters right now. I would try to find that out because that's really the market that you're trying to play into somehow. At least right, right. I mean, well, mm -hmm. I mean, we also built it to scale. So you know, right now we start with our primary use, but you know, it, it is compatible with 3G and 4G. Uh, so you know, you could everyone could be their own walking radio station the only difference with that everybody, no everyone could be but everyone will not be like this is just not something that a lot of people will be doing there are some segment of people who will be doing it who that this fits into their modus operandi their usage patterns but it's not something everybody will be doing so we need to understand the granular at a much more granular level what what exactly is the total available market for this So right, right. No, no, I, I do understand. Yeah. Go ahead and ask your questions. Let's look at your questions and see where. Uh... Right. So, um, you know, right now, we, you know, we're in a unique position where, you know, we're useful for two people to use instead of, you know, it's very different from, you know, say, Angry Birds, where you can enjoy it by yourself, um, you know, since it creates a new kind of shared experience. Um, you know, how do you think that should affect how we market it? Well, I think one of the things you're doing, from what I can tell you're doing effectively, is getting uh, written up about get, getting PR and especially guerrilla PR. That would be one of the best ways for you to get your concept out there because it's a concept that people need to understand how it works and how it plays. And then there are a bunch of app search engines and stuff where uh, you know, reviews and rating sites where you want to be reviewed. Uh, so those are those are ways you can get your word out there. Other than that, I would try. I would um, I would understand how headphone splitters are marketed. I would do a lot of research on how they're marketing headphone splitters. Is there a Google search uh, stream around headphone splitters and stuff like that? And and then try to align my marketing strategy with that. Uh, I guess so. My next question was, you know, since we've kept it free, you know, uh, it kind of the two questions are kind of one question. You know, how do you know when's best to switch over to a paid model, and um, you know, what's more important, you know, extracting that download fee, or you know, if, if we made sixty thousand dollars so far from charging a dollar ninety nine for the download, you know, would that, you know, is that more important than having you know X number of users? See, personally, I like companies that monetize. I'm not a huge fan of companies that have to run a lot of red ink for extended periods of time and not monetize. So if you are already charging $1.99 for download and you were able to generate $60,000 from 30,000 customers, I, I much prefer that model than trying to get a million users free of charge and then you have to foot that bill yourself. Which is very difficult to do. Then you have to immediately you are you're dependent on outside funding and and all that. But if you have a model where people are paying for your products, you're offering value. If people are paying for your products and you're able to support your operation through cash flow generation, you know, uh, revenue generation, I much prefer that model. That makes sense. So, so your qu the two questions are exactly right. You're, there is one question. I think you are already doing the right thing of actually charging now as opposed to waiting to generate a bunch of uh, free customers and then charging later. Right. I mean, well, like, like I kind of said before, um, you know, we kind of really think that it, it'll be music that, that leads it to spread. So, so not so much there's this cool app I want you to download, but... You know, if, if one of two people who would, you know, find it useful know about it, you know, if, if I'm with my friend and I have it and I want to play him a song, I'd say, oh, you know, do you have my stream? Oh, if not, download it. 
and you know since it's such a marginal fee to be able to use it for so long you know what what we we really see is uh you know it's at such a low price point that it really only needs to be uh marginally useful and considering the potential market is you know 300 plus million devices uh you know even 1% you know is is uh 3 million so yeah um, I think you can yeah i would keep going the way you're going you know using guerrilla marketing and 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 just generating cash straight away instead of waiting and and doing any kind of premium i prefer what you're doing than doing a premium model Gotcha. Great. Uh, and then I guess the last, yeah, thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Do you have another question? Uh, but the last thing I would want to say was, you know, we also have some really significant uh, technology, you know, in the application. Um, you know, we put server technology uh, on a device, uh, on a mobile device level. And not only is each user in our network, you know, their own server, which is part of the way we differ from these other uh, streaming music services. Uh, but each, each, each user in the network is simultaneously a client and a server. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, we also enable playlist sharing where I could go into your device and play anything that you have in your playlist, and you could simultaneously go into mine and play anything that I have in my playlist. And in that form of network communications, which is uh, also patent pending, um, you know, each user is simultaneously acting as both a client and a server. And uh, that doesn't uh, exist outside of uh, our app as far as we've researched and as, uh, you know, as far as we can tell. And so, you know, is there any way you would recommend to kind of play that up? I mean, we don't want to really broadcast that because it is, you know, trade uh, te technology that, you know, we have pending. But well, you have to, kind of uh, my recommendation would be to get the, customers in with your basic value proposition of headphone splitting basically is the value proposition that you're offering at a much lower price point in a much more elegant way. Um, I would get the customers in with that and then introduce them gradually to the other functionality to, you know, keep them in basically. It's a sub you said the $1.99 subscription for a year or a quarter, a month? What's the subscription month? I mean, you know, right now, the, right now, Apple doesn't have it set up to rent, although they are kind of, it looks like they may open up that model. Um, but no, it, it would just be kind of like a purchase price once you buy it's it. It's a purchase yeah. price, okay. Okay. So then you could, the other thing you could do, it, you need to do some market testing, is um, introduce that the additional functionality as an upgrade, as an upsell to the customers that you bring in and, and sell to those customers. Yeah, that makes sense, actually. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right. Um, Seishu, you're next. They see Sauda. Yeah. Uh, morning, everyone. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. All right, cool. All right. Um, so, just wanted to give you a brief uh, description about myself. Um, kind of, it kind of reflects my what kind of a person or what kind of an entrepreneur I am. So, I I was doing my MBA at NCAD and in France actually. And at that point of time, I actually realized that the students at my school needed some similar product like Zipcar. And so, I started while as a student started. A uh, car leasing company, um, so it's kind of like it kind of reflects my personality in the sense that I look up and I like basically see an opportunity and start acting on that. That kind of translates what the current company is all about. Uh, I first came to know about Groupon, frankly speaking, in the month of December of last year, and and followed the company for a couple of weeks and saw the need in need for um, something same concept, but more targeted towards the South Asian population in U.S. and beyond. So Desi Sauda is all about offering deals um, to South Asian communities living in U.S. and beyond. So Desi is typically refers to a South Asian, and Sauda is either you can it's, it's either bargain or a deal. So combining these two terms brings the essence of what what this venture is all about. So should, uh, uh, what, is this a, then it, does that mean that you're going to have merchandise products that 
uh, that South Asians buy? Yeah, it's, it's it's the same concept as Groupon, but offering deals from your Indian uh, restaurants or Pakistani grill places or the educational institutions like the Kumon and the Alohas and those kind of things. Okay. I mean, uh, my, my the question I'm asking you is that there is this niche that you're going after. There's got to be some merchandising angle to the niche, right? Yeah. In the sense that when you say merchandising angle, I didn't get that. Well, I mean, wh wh why is it not uh, okay for Living Social or Groupon to offer Kumon coupons or uh, you know, Indian restaurant coupons, they can do it just, just as well. What is it, what is it about the site, South Asian demographic that is, wh why would South Asians sign on to you, um, to Desi Sauda? Is there a specific type of products that you focus on or products or services that you focus on as opposed to the generic uh, living social group on local merchant, local marketing? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we, we basically target uh, or what the kind of merchandise or the kind of deals which we offer are very specific, like the, the dosa places or, or anything that which we as a South Asians would prefer to go after. Or we consume like 60 to 70 percent of our income goes towards food and other things like the groceries and those kind of. So we offer deals from those categories. So South Asian grocery stores and um, South Asian restaurants, those kinds of things. Okay. Absolutely. As and opposed again, to nails uh, and it, spas. Yeah, as opposed to fencing classes or anything like that. All right. If if you go back to the uh, previous slide, please. So again, we kind of talked on this subject in terms of who we are targeting is typically majority or like 80% or 90% of our market is basically the South Asian. Uh, but there are others in the mainstream as well who likes to eat Indian food or, or basically do some kind of a, a deal or go to grocery stores or something like that. But majority is are, are the South Asian customers or from the end customer perspective. And from a vendor perspective or the business side of it, we actually target anyone who wants to capture this market. All right, uh, for example, um, in Dallas right now where we are operational, uh, we actually made a proposal to uh, uh, a Mexican restaurant. It's a chain, Don Pablo's, and we kind of get, got a very positive feedback, and hopefully we'll be getting a deal from them. So from a business side, we target anyone who wants to cater to this market in the sense of the South Asian market. And our value proposition, again, going back to the end customer, is that um, we are offering a very special, when I, I wouldn't call it a specialized, but it's more like a personalized deal or a customized deal, which I, as, as, an, as a South Asian, would like to go for. And then also on the customer side, on the business side, we actually offer something which uh, the niche market, which has a high disposable income, and then we are basically giving a channel for them to kind of ta tap into this market. Okay. And in, ter and in terms of like how we actually go after the customers, like the, the, it is like, you know, through these four channels, right? We do on Google ads and all that, but again, uh, wherever we as uh, the South Asian community goes or, or uh, frequents like samachar.com or rediff.com, so through that online advertising. And we also, uh, are present in some of the concerts, or we're also present in the in, in the radio shows and all those kind of things, and also through the social media in terms of the Facebooks and, and the Twitters and all that stuff. Uh, and one more thing which we are mainly focused on is actually the partnerships. Uh, for example, in Bay Area, we are partnered with the Bay Area Desi. Um, in Dallas, Fanesha is actually a media house. And um, today morning itself, we actually had a verbal agreement with Suleika to have our deal featured. Uh, they becoming an affiliate for Desi Saga. So we are heavily focusing on the partnerships as well as like the nonprofits like the Shankarai Foundation, through which we actually reach out to uh, to our target segment. Okay. So right now we are uh, operational in Dallas and Houston. 
Uh, we are launching in Bay Area. Um, our tentative date is set to be October 22nd. Uh, we are working towards that. And I have also plans of starting in New Jersey and Chicago area quite uh, soon. Uh, by December, we plan to be operational in at least five to six different cities. Um, that's that's how far we are into this. Uh, what is your um, uh, how much revenue, for instance, is Dallas generating? So we were operational in Dallas uh, for three months. We have generated around twenty thousand uh, dollars in in revenue. So why are you why are you trying to get into so many markets without first optimizing one city? Um, it, again, from uh, from a from a, a company perspective, we want to be spread as many cities as possible to kind of go after the VC funding. Frankly, no, so this that is kind a of flawed us... strategy. This is an absolutely flawed strategy, and this is a strategy Sorry? that Groupon and, and Living Social are cutting back on. There is no point in go going to one city and generating twenty thousand dollars off that city without really penetrating that city and executing on the, on that city. Just spray, sp this is this is what we call in one million by one million spray and pray, and you shouldn't be doing it. Mm -hmm. I would really focus on one or two cities, ideally actually one city, and really penetrate that city in a very deep way so that you have real you know real revenues coming out of that city twenty thousand dollars is nothing hmm. this i don't i don't buy at all the strategy of spray and pray and penetrating 15 cities without really penetrating any of them properly So our, our thinking in terms of going spreading to different cities is just that like we want to be in uh, our presence first. Obviously, there is a cost associated with that. There is a huge of, like, cost associated with cost. going to new cities. Huge cost. And it doesn't make any sense to me. Mm. And you will not go viral if you are if you are spreading yourself thin, the viral impact is not going to happen. The viral impact happens when you have concentrated, highly networked groups, you know, who, who, uh, who represent that viral behavior. So if you are in Dallas and if you're really deeply penetrated, let's say in the Gujarati society in Dallas, and you are catering to Gujarati um, deals, people deals that Gujaratis are looking for, that's when they start talking among themselves. And if you don't do that kind of granular, deep penetration, you will not really get the impact of the viral model. Mm. Viral penetration requires critical mass. And, and our opinion, again, it, it's, it's just that like why we want to be present from a point of view that we want to be the first movers in different cities targeting this market. And 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 that's the reason why we are as in going after this. To us, when we when you talk of viral, right, like spreading from one city to another city, that itself, are you basically saying that if you're penetrated in the let's say, talk about the Gujarati community in here in Dallas, that would kind of spread to other cities because we are offering. I would not. It would spread like within these. Dallas, but you first need to spread within Dallas before you spread to other cities. These kind of viral. Um, uh, marketing happens in, in very concentrated uh, circles. My point is, if you're going to Dallas and Austin and Chicago and Boston and Bay Area, the viral impact is not going to spread as easily because you're not investing in seeding the viral concepts in, in each of those cities. Like if you, are, if you are doing it in one city and you penetrate systematically each of these ethnic communities, the Indian you know, uh, South Asian or Desi is not, is not really the way um, things spread. You're going to have to penetrate all these subgroups and subcultures, the maybe India Community Center in the Bay Area, maybe, uh, you know, these, there are, I mean, there are 15 Bengali associations in the Bay Area. 
So if I were penetrating the Bay Area, I would go penetrate each of them individually and they within themselves, they will create some viral. That's how I would seed the viral marketing. Okay. Right. So, so I would really maximize one city in the in as creative as po possible ways, and really maximize the revenues out of that. Uh, and you are not re ready for VC funding by any stretch of imagination. This is group one of this and group one of that is the VC market is flooded with these kinds of deals. And the only way you're going to get any kind of interest from VCs if you can show real revenue traction. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 Yep. 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 All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Deborah, you next? Yes, I'm here. Go ahead. Uh, okay, thank you. My name is Deborah Cortez, and I'm an artist, designer, entrepreneur living in Miami, Florida. I've been creating images that share the beauty, power, and magic of nature for most of my life. And in the fall of 2007, I created the first Nature's Energy Cortez Design Bags as an, another way for me to generate income with doing work that I enjoy. The handbag business offered a much larger market than I was reaching with my art alone, and while bag sales added to my income, I believe the growth potential will be greatly increased when I'm able to assemble an experienced team. I'm now refocusing on creating custom lines for business-to-business -business clients. The exclusivity of custom design bags, for instance, only available at Canyon Ranch Boutique or only to members of Women's Fund, positions the bags as highly desirable collectibles and more valuable than comparable non-exclusive products. This slide that's on there now is my casual tote bag with a matching clutch purse. Uh, it, it features a child's voice logo on a stylized color enhanced pattern derived from a jade vine plant image. Child's Deborah, voice is a learning program. Deborah, yeah, tell me yeah. more about the deal with child's voice. How does this come about? Who, how many, uh, how, who pays what, how much, in what, uh, with what terms? Okay, um, I'm going to start by saying that even though I've been doing this for four years, it's been a, a sideline and everything's totally bootstrapped. I kind of live that way. That's not um, my question. Voice. My question is precisely about child's voice. So you design the bag for child's voice. How much do they right. pay? They can't. Do you get royalty on it? What's the structure of this deal? Okay. <laughs> I'm ready for this. Um, they contacted me. They found me on the internet. I created the bag to donate to them on the um, with the position that I would also be setting up a web page for them to also sell the bags, like a joint venture, an affiliate. Um, I did that. They took the bags, and this has happened in every case. They auction the bags off. They make some money, and there's no backup promotion. So technically, they've sold nothing, and that okay. will be the same for the next few slides. So then this business is not a business. It's not worth pursuing. Right. At that, well, the way that I've been doing it, yes. That's why I'm here. I'm here to find out if it is a viable business. Not the way you've structured it at all. I mean, people designing stuff for people for free who don't pay anything, that's not a business. Right. Well, I'm not going to design it for free anymore. That's the. So have you tried to not design for free and get paid for it? Um, I'm, that's where I'm at right now. I mean, I've finally gotten to the point where I realized that this was ridiculous. And uh, have you gone to the corporation, corporate partners? Like in Florida, of course, there are lots of luxury resorts. And uh, is, that, is that a segment that you've explored to try to design for them, by, uh, custom design bags that fit their um, brand image and stuff? Right, with their brand. Well, that's that's what I'm looking at doing now. And uh, honestly, because it's only me, um, I guess that's my my people. Because I don't think it's, it's only going to be you, because right. hiring people costs money, and you can't afford it. Right, right. Well, you would have to go talk to the luxury luxury resorts and get design projects from them and build from there. 
Okay. There's no way you can hire people right now. Okay. No, I know that. I was, I've, I've done very well with bartering and partnerships up until now. Uh, most of the photography and promotion has been that way. What does that mean? You've done very well. You just told me you got, you basically designed no, stuff. I mean, has, has, yes, yes, not in sales, but in helping with the promotional part. But you need to get sales. So the whole point of business is to get sales. Right, right. Okay, so going that, forward, I mean, I mean, going forward, I'd like you to be disciplined about how you negotiate your contracts. Stop doing free stuff, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, okay. work with people who are able to pay, willing and able to pay, and maybe luxury resorts is a seg segment that you can go work with and uh, and start figuring out how you make money. Okay, I, I think I, I probably I, knew that and needed confirmation, and it's a good exercise. So I appreciate that. All right. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, folks, I think uh, what I'm going to do next is give you a little overview of uh, 1 million by 1 million. Now, as I said right up front, we need help from you and we need serious entrepreneurs. 1 million by 1 million needs serious entrepreneurs who can, who have the resilience and the focus to execute on business ideas. Um, that are going to become serious sustainable businesses and that's a lot of work it takes tremendous work ethic tremendous resilience tremendous commitment to build businesses and if you are here and perhaps you want to join one million by one million and become one of the entrepreneurs doing that and if you could each help bring in 10 serious entrepreneurs into one million by one million we would very much appreciate it because that's what really this whole initiative is about around the world making serious entrepreneurs successful, equipping them with the resources that we bring to the table and then making them successful. So let's talk about what resources we do offer for you at various different levels. So the website of 1 million by 1 million is 1m1m.stromanamitra.com. Uh, the first level of resources uh, is our blog, which is entirely free. There's a ton of content on that blog. A lot of people learn by reading the case studies on the blog and, and just you know following the blog itself. The next level is the Entrepreneur Journeys book series, which is a collection of case studies, effectively four volumes of books that are based on case studies and synthesis. Um, those books are all available on Amazon, Kindle internationally, and uh, Flipkart also in India. The first volume has 12 case studies. Actually, each of the volumes have 12 to 16 case studies. The second volume focuses on bootstrapping, which is a cornerstone philosophy of 1 million by 1 million. You know, I um, want to give you a statistic. I was reading just a few days ago that Y Combinator is receiving one application a minute right now for companies that want to be incubated and funded by Y Combinator. And they take what, maybe 35 to 40 per class. So there's a very, very large number of entrepreneurs out there who are looking for guidance, who are looking for incubation support. And that's something we provide. But please understand that the number of people who get funded out of that huge mass of entrepreneurs who want to access resources is minuscule. So over 99% of companies who look for financing get rejected and there are various reasons why they get rejected and we have a very good understanding of those reasons so we want to make sure that you are successful and you know what is what you need to do and not bump around from door to door of investors looking for financing the third volume of entrepreneur journeys is positioning how to test validate and bring your idea to market Positioning, once again, you know, you heard me talk about do not spray and pray. That is the mantra of 1 million by 1 million. And laser sharp positioning is what allows you to be successful as an early stage bootstrapping entrepreneur. Every entrepreneur in the early stages has to bootstrap. Unless you are, you know, a very experienced serial entrepreneur with lots of track record who, who, have existing who has existing relationships, 
And you can walk into a venture capitalist's office or an angel investor's office and say, here's my idea, here's my you know, couple of slide decks, and uh, sign me a check of half a million dollars, and somebody will do so. Most entrepreneurs don't have that luxury. So you're going to have to follow these mechanics of bootstrapping, positioning to be successful, and that's something we will work with you shoulder to shoulder to make sure that you understand those concepts and you implement those concepts in very disciplined ways. The fourth volume of Entrepreneur Journeys is Innovation Need of the Hour, and together this collection would be a good introduction to the 1 million by 1 million methodology. And the blog is extramanamitra.com. On top of that, the other piece of free resource we have is the RD's 1 million by 1 million strategy roundtables, which happens pretty much every Thursday. These are free. This is our 101st roundtable. Over 7,000 people have attended these roundtables. I have personally coached over 400 entrepreneurs. So we have a tremendous amount of experience in understanding where people are going wrong, where, what are the repeatable what are, what are the repeated mistakes that we see or repeated questions that we see? And we want you to avoid avoidable mistakes. There are lots of avoidable mistakes in entrepreneurship, and we want to equip you with the knowledge and understanding to avoid these mistakes. And that's what the One Million by One Million program focuses on. Then we come to the premium program, which is a $1,000 annual membership fee for unlimited access to our extensive methodology guidance. We have a fabulous curriculum. And by the way, the program is not some generic curriculum. The program actually helps you focus on your specific business. So you will get the curriculum to help you understand the framework of building a business. But we have strategy consulting, just like this session today. You know, I work with four entrepreneurs. And, and I, what, what was I doing? I was basically doing strategy consulting, online strategy consulting. And that's exactly what we do in the premium program as well. We have private roundtables where we do extensive strategy consulting. And the curriculum gives you framework. The strategy consulting gives you guidance on your specific situation. And we also do a lot of business development. You heard me talk to McKillen about plugging her into potentially one of our channel partners through which she can access a large national channel to go to market through. These kinds of deals of connecting you to customers, connecting to you to business development potential uh, channel partners, we do an, a lot of that. If you're a company selling into the small business market, for instance, we, we let you use the 1 million by 1 million channel itself to market. There's a lot of business going on within the community where com companies trying to reach customers are selling into or marketing into the 1 million by 1 million community itself. There are trusted relationships that we pair you with. So all that adds up, and, and it's basically all of it is accessible within the premium membership. And of course, we help you with financing. When you're ready for financing, we also help you with financing. We have, uh, you know, we have done financings. We also help you negotiate these. We make introductions to investors. We also help you negotiate, it, negotiate these financing rounds where you, um, you know, whatever terms you get, we try to help you with negotiating those terms. You know, you can look at liquidation preference, tranche financing, all sorts of complex terminology that as first-time entrepreneurs, you t tend to not have experience with. So we have a very, very extensive network in Silicon Valley and elsewhere in the world. One Million by One Million is a highly regarded brand in the investor community as well as in the business community. So um, just by being part of this brand and this community, you will have access to a certain level of network, especially the Silicon Valley network, um, that can take you very far. And the methodology is based on hundreds of serious, successful entrepreneurs teaching you how to leverage the strategies and learnings that they have had in their journeys. I'll talk about that in a minute. Now, if you come into the program, let's say you sign up for 1 million by 1 million premium. One of the first things we'll ask you to do is take the self-assessment. And the self-assessment covers nine specific areas. And in each of those areas, it'll ask you questions 
and it will also point you to curriculum modules to digest so that you can plug the gaps in your understanding of each of those categories. So that by the time, you know, it'll take you probably a weekend to finish the full self-assessment, including the curriculum modules. And that would be a very good way for you to get started and immediately get a core level of knowledge about your business and get calibrate yourself against the framework. Then on top of that, we have the curriculum. And that curriculum is, uh, is part of the premium program. It, the curriculum is built on hundreds of case studies. I have, over the last six years, invited um, over 500 entrepreneurs, thought leaders, industry champions uh, onto, one million, onto this forum to share their successes, their failures, their strategies, their learnings, what they've learned that they shouldn't do with us. So this curriculum you could think of as being taught by these 500 plus very experienced entrepreneurs. And even though I am delivering the video lectures which synthesize these lessons, the, all the case studies are available for you in a synthesized manner and you are basically being taught the 1 million by 1 million program by a large number of entrepreneurs, not just by me. Remember that, that's very, very powerful. So what to expect from the premium program? If you go to the top right corner of the 1 million by 1 million page, you have premium program and FAQ two buttons, and those explain to you in detail, a lot more detail, what you can expect from the programs. Our methodology is lean, capital efficient, bootstrap startups. Very recently, just yesterday actually, uh, we have an entrepreneur in the premium program who's just joined recently. And she, she asked me, um, she's about to spend $15,000 on getting a minimum viable product prototype built. And she asked me, um, so I am doing blah, 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 and I, uh, I'm, I would like to know what are my options in terms of spending this $15,000? So yesterday at the round table, I worked with her. She pitched me, she explained to me what she's working on. And I basically told her that you should not trigger this $15,000 development process yet, because you haven't done the groundwork necessary to do the positioning and the product design that would make this $15,000 investment worthwhile. If she hadn't talked to me, she would have gone and invested this $15,000 and this $15,000 would have gone down the drain because she's just not ready to start product development yet. She hasn't done enough competitive analysis. She doesn't understand her market well enough to trigger that investment. So my point is, we have been in your shoes. I am a serial entrepreneur myself. I've done both bootstrap startups as well as funded startups. I have actually 1 million by 1 million is a bootstrapped early stage startup. It is not a nonprofit. It's not a foundation, nothing. It is a small business just like you. And I have had offers for financing, but I've so far chosen not to take money just because I have a certain methodology that we teach in 1 million by 1 million, which is to build enough value before taking outside capital and really putting yourself in a position where if you do take outside capital, you're taking it at valuation levels and levels of equity control that are, that are reasonable and effective in building a company. Companies go out of business all the time because they get money too soon. They take money too soon. You take a little bit of money too soon, that money runs out, your staying power goes out of the window. Because then you're stuck with a large portion of your company being owned by investors and you haven't reached milestones to be able to raise another round of financing. This is not the way to build companies. So anyway, this is a very long discussion on when you should raise money, when you shouldn't raise money, what are the terms under which you should raise money. All that is being covered in our methodology, but the methodology is definitely about lean, capital efficient, bootstrap startups. We are very respectful of your resources and we want you to preserve your resources. So if you choose to become a premium member of the 1 million by 1 million program, the $1,000 a year that you're going to invest, my hypothesis is you're going to save a ton of 
garbage investments elsewhere. And in some cases, you're going to raise money. In some cases, you're going to, you know, raise customer capital. We have we have a number of number of entrepreneurs in the premium program who are who have, don't have a dime of outside financing, who are nicely making progress, building revenues and, and you know, building their businesses by following the methodology. And you know, one of our companies actually won a $40,000 grant. So he walked in the door, paid his $1,000 membership, and within, uh, within about 45 days or 60 days, something like that, they, he worked with us, and, and he won a Microsoft startup grant for, of $40,000. So immediately his investment paid off. So there's lots of these kinds of you know, nuances to the program. We are going to connect every possible dot that we can possibly connect for you. The core curriculum, by the way, has seven modules, and we, we recommend that you invest the time and energy to really study the core cur curriculum. It's going to take you 50, 60 hours to fully digest the core curriculum. You can get the self-assessment probably done within a weekend, but you know, as you build your company, I would like you to understand the core curriculum in, in a lot more depth, and that includes bootstrapping, positioning, market sizing, customer validation, financing, customer acquisition, and team building. And each of them, we have very lean methodology. You know, one of the premium members asked me, they were getting a lot of customers. We follow the strategy of how to get them into the market and start validating the market, and that strategy worked. And he was getting lots of business suddenly. And he asked me, so should I start hiring lots of people? And my recommendation was, no, do not start hiring so many people right now. Work with freelancers first and understand the model of what it takes to service your customers before you go out and hire a lot of people. Because there are lots of implications of hiring people. Um, and, and we want you to understand the business and, and what are the pieces that you do need to scale on a permanent basis and what are the pieces that you need to experiment with before you invest the money in hiring lots of people. So the whole thing is going to be about preserving your cash, preserving your resources, and executing in as lean a manner as possible. Now, as far as the elective modules are concerned, there's a whole bunch of elective modules that include Web 3.0 and e-commerce, cloud computing and business solutions, outsourcing and consulting, mobile and social apps, healthcare IT, online education. All these are elective modules that we have built out for you so that you understand the trends of those specific industries and the nuances of those specific industries. And you have case studies supporting businesses that are built within those specific industries. And we have definitive expertise in all the trends that are aligned with the industry today in technology, technology enabled services, internet businesses. Where we don't do so well is in very capital intensive businesses. If you come to me and say that, oh, I need to build a medical device company and I need to raise $50 million off the bat, that is not something I can help you with because it is not, we don't have that expertise and that is a very, very high risk game. Same with clean tech. If you come and tell me I'm going to put solar panels everywhere and I need $50 million right away, this is not what we do. We can't help you there. Or you want to develop a new drug, that's not our sweet spot. Um, so as I said, this is case, this curriculum and both the core and the elective consists of several hundred successful case, stu uh, case studies of successful entrepreneurs synthesized with video lectures. So it's, it's fairly efficient. You can, like uh, Micheline said, it's a kind of an MBO on steroids. Yes, it is. You, with, if you spend 100 hours fully digesting the 1 million by 1 million curriculum in all its depth, it is equivalent to an a very focused MBA, entrepreneurship focused MBA, and that focuses on case studies of, of very early stage startups in technology, technology enabled services, and internet businesses. That is our core competency. Um, we talked about business development. Persistent Systems is a company that we work with, and that is one of the companies where we have very strong channel penetration, national channel penetration, and we are putting some of our companies through our persistent relationship. This is going to be a revenue sharing deal, and, and Nicolene, as I said, we will be exploring this one for you. Um, we do a lot of PR for our companies. 
We have very, very strong syndicated columns, lots of presence, uh, lots of credibility as analysts. And um, we, are, we put all that into action on your behalf. So this is an article about Orenscape, that is a 1 million by 1 million premium company in Read Right Web, where posi we position them as an Indian company plugging a gap in Google's App Engine product. And this is a very, very powerful exposure, powerful positioning that gives them credibility in the market. Um, this is a note from a, from a 1 million by 1 million participant in one of these roundtables who came to uh, my Facebook page and said, you know, I wish this program was around four years ago. I had raised a lot of angel financing and I didn't do things in the right sequence. I wasted a lot of that money and now I don't have any money left. This is a topic that, this is a comment that we hear from people all the time is, I wish 1 million by 1 million were around four years ago or three years ago when I was starting out. So now that 1 million by 1 million is there, please take advantage of it. And, you know, I, I can tell you one thing, I'm not going to sugarcoat feedback. And you heard me today where I saw that I needed to call you on flawed strategy. I called you on flawed strategy. And that is the reason to participate in 1 million by 1 million, not to hear what you want to hear. Uh, we are here to tell you what is going to work, not what you want to hear. Um, we work with a lot of incubators. We have, um, for instance, we have a company right now in 1 million by 1 million premium called Wealth Gathering, and they presented at the 100th roundtable last week. And they were introduced to us by a, a, in, an incubator we work with in Maine. So Michael Goldman was sponsored into 1 million by 1 million by his incubator. And he's been working with us for several months now, and he's recently been named a top gun entrepreneur in Maine. And that will give him access to an additional, uh, you know, tranche of resources from that incubator. So we are we supplement resources of incubators. If you're an incubator uh, in the room today, please, by all means, reach out to us and we'll be delighted to supplement what, whatever resources you are bringing to your uh, local entrepreneurs. We will be able to supplement that with the 1 million by 1 million program. MAD Incubator in Malaysia is also a partner of ours. We have a very concrete affiliate program, and I think several of our affiliate partners are in the room today. Arlene Maram, I can see. In Israel, uh, we offer a 10% affiliate membership fee uh, to all our partners, whereby um, anybody who signs up, premium members, gets $100 per membership. So if you have a large community of entrepreneurs that you're trying to support and you want to monetize that, uh, you know, whether it's a blog or a, uh, or a business network or a, um, you know, nonprofit, whatever, you're very welcome to become a member of the 1 million by 1 million affiliate program and you can have a revenue stream against that. Our upcoming free roundtables are October 20th, 27th, November 3rd, 10th and 17th. So you have lots of options to come and uh, work with us here. And uh, that's pretty much all in terms of resources. One other resource for those of you who are interested in India is I have a book called Vision India 2020 which has $45 billion business ideas. And they're quite fleshed out, actually, because this is written as business fiction, as if we are sitting in 2020, looking back on building these companies. And they span a variety of different industries, technology, technology-enabled services, infrastructure, energy, lifestyle, businesses, entertainment, healthcare, all sorts of things. And you're very welcome to take one of these ideas and build on it. And we do have entrepreneurs in 1 million by 1 million who are taking some of these ideas and building on those ideas. There's a module in 1 million by 1 million that specifically focused on Vision India 2020 ideas. And, uh, you know, I am doing 1 million by 1 million. It's going to take me my lifetime to execute on this. You are very welcome to take one of the other ideas and, and I will be delighted to help you execute and realize that. Um, we have a lot of partners in the industry that we work with, from Microsoft to Read Write Web to Startup America Partnership to uh, MIT Club of Northern California and the MIT Alumni Associations of various kinds. Um, I 
that's my alumni association, of course. And uh, we work with many Thai chapters. Thai is one of the largest entrepreneurship development organization in the world. We work with various angel groups, lots of VCs who are looking at our deals, and lots of angel investors who are looking at our deals, persistent I talked about already, various incubators. So we thank all of them. And of course, our technology partners, Vview, who's hosting this roundtable today and has been hosting roundtables with us throughout this year. Um, now, my group chat, by the way, is open at this point. So if you are uh, interested in asking questions, please feel free to do so in the group chat and I will answer, answer those questions. Um, anybody interested in uh, asking questions is very welcome to do so. Yes, go ahead, Seshu. For reaching out to customers, how does affiliate program sound? Affiliate program can be a very, very effective uh, way of reaching out to customers. There's no question about it. So for your purpose, I think affiliate program will work very well. You could make affiliate relationships. You could strike affiliate relationships with all these regional associations, like we were talking about the Gujarati affiliation, uh, association, for instance, and um, Suleika, sure. But for what you're trying to do, I would really look at these ethnic groups in, in, the, in your region. Michelle is asking, at what point in your business idea development is it best to get involved with 1M1M? What milestones need to be achieved before getting the most benefit out of the premium membership? Michelle, I would suggest you get in as early as possible because one thing we, we uh, recommend and we have entrepreneurs who are working with, with, who start with multiple ideas and they use our validation methodology to validate those ideas because um, at some times in one of our uh, Nithi Mehta, for instance, was work started with an idea. Actually, there are several of them who started with an idea and followed the validation methodology and realized that the idea does not validate. So what I want you to do is not waste a lot of time working on an idea that doesn't have legs. I want you to use our validation methodology and if, it, if the idea doesn't have legs, I want you to eliminate that idea, rule that idea out very quickly and get on an idea, a different idea. And as you work with the case studies, you will not only learn the validation methodology, you will also understand a lot of the trends and the mechanics and it will trigger a lot of ideas in your head. So, so I think if you're very early with an idea, it's better to join and, and follow our methodology because your idea may not have legs and you don't want to waste six to nine months on an idea that does not have legs. That is something we are seeing constantly is ideas that do not have legs that need to be re reinvented or reprogrammed uh, or restructured and that is something we do a very good job of. Anybody else? Um, I think I see some questions about who is eligible for the 1 million by 1 million program. Everybody is eligible. We are, you know, contrary to other incubators who are, who pride themselves on how exclusive they are. You know, Y Combinator, Techstars, they are very exclusive programs. They take pride in the fact that they're very exclusive. We allow anybody and everybody to use the program and make progress. And the, whole, the way we have designed the program and structured the program is so that anybody can use the program, anybody can sign up for the program and learn from the program. So it is really an effort to democratize entrepreneurship in a very, very big way, in a global way. Wherever you are in the world, you can access this program. We are 100% virtual. And the 
curriculum is completely online. You can work on the curriculum entirely at your own time on a self-service mode. So it's video lectures and online case studies. And then the, the round tables, the strategy consulting is all in an download, online format. So everything is scalable. Anybody can join the program. Santosh says, I'm based in Chennai, working on a business idea in food re retailing. Please share some of your experience in non-IT internet-based businesses. We don't do non-IT, non-technology internet-based businesses. Um, I don't think retail is well, something that we do necessarily. If you're trying to do food retailing with, with your primary uh, customer acquisition strategy being on the internet, then we can work with you. We have extensive experience in e-commerce and customer acquisition that is internet-based customer acquisition, but we don't do, we don't necessarily specialize in retail. Anybody else? Any other questions? And, and by the way, Irina is suggesting that if you want to talk, to talk to somebody on the phone to discuss your specific situation and how 1 million by 1 million applies to you, you can call her at 786-301-2456. Percy says, what are the primary differences in investing in Indian technology startups versus US ones? Um, you know, one of the differences is that Indian technology startups can bootstrap much far further with very little capital. So just because the cost structure, the base cost structure is a lot lower, bootstrapping capital works a long, much longer way. You know, you put in a million dollars into an, a, a, an Indian startup, that will go a much, much longer, that will probably sustain a couple of years versus in the US it will get fin it will get spent much sooner because the cost structure is different anybody else roberto do you plan to do any physical workshop forum in order that entrepreneur shares its ideas and creates synergies no we don't do anything physical i give a lot of speeches you know physical speeches in in the silicon valley area or if i'm traveling in a geography where um, you know, I, I get invitations to speak in different places all the time. And sometimes on these speaking tours, we do physical roundtables, same format as what you saw today, but we would do it in an in-person situation. But it doesn't happen very often. So if you're interested in using 1 million by 1 million, you are going to have to use it in a, in a virtual mode because the 1 million by 1 million program is a virtual program. The, the physical roundtables are exceptions, not, not really the rule. Guru Prasad is asking, in what way your 1M, 1M help a startup to connect with customers or other communities that could help to generate revenue for a startup? You know, we have a very, very extensive network. So once I understand what business you're working on, I will introduce you to startups, uh, introduce you to customers. And, and, you know, our companies that are in the program have, because of 1 million by 1 million, been introduced to very, very high level decision makers whom they would never be able to access on their own. CIO of Intel, CIO of VMware, CIO of Intuit. These are the kinds of people that they would never have been able to get in front of without 1 million by 1 million. Percy is asking, are the exit strategies also different? Not necessarily. Um, if you are, there is some difference because the Indian public market actually sustains uh, IPOs at a much lower revenue level. So smaller companies are able to gain liquidity in the Indian market, in the Indian public market, uh, in the Indian stock exchange, be just because the, the size requirements are different. In the US, typically you need to be a hundred million dollar company to go public, you know, at least $50 million company. In India, you can go public as a $10 million company. Anybody else? Any other questions?
No, looks like we are uh, we are done. All right, I look forward to uh, working with uh, many of you in the premium program, and uh, hopefully you guys are all going to make great progress and uh, hit your one million point. By the way, once you reach the one million point, a lot of options open up. You know, the you you basically turn the table on the negotiation. Once you're able to reach a million dollars in revenue, you turn the table on the negotiation, especially if you're looking for capital, the investors are at that point looking to come to you as opposed to you chasing the investors. You'll still have to get yourself known, but if you can say that I already have a million dollars in annual revenue and, and potentially you're profitable, and that's something we're gonna to try to get you to, you are in a much, much stronger negotiating position. One of the case studies we teach in One Million by One Million is the story of Sridhar Vembu, who has built a $100 million plus company with zero outside capital. And the, ever since, you know, for the last four years, VCs have been chasing him. And he's just not interested in venture capital because he has an extremely profitable $100 million plus company. This company is going to go to a billion dollar, and I think he's going to bootstrap to a billion dollar company, basically. Okay, so with that, I will uh, adjourn the session and we are going to meet again uh, next week. The private roundtable next week is on Monday evening at 6 p.m. Uh, Pacific time and uh, a public roundtable is the usual Thursday morning, 8 a.m. Pacific time. All right, everybody, thank you for uh, being in the show today and uh, we will see you soon.